it was pandemonium when I got there. The, the block was locked down. You could see baseball bats peeked out from under the snorkels. You could see knives. I saw a machete. And I was just like, what the fuck is going on here? So yeah, this is, uh, this might have been the shoe that started it all. The Nike Pigeon Dunk SB Low official. I think after the shoe came out, you know, like a whole different generation of people and a whole different demographic of person got into buying sneakers. Before, most people bought sneakers because they needed something comfortable to walk around in and when a pair of shoes died, they'd buy another pair of shoes. That's how people consumed footwear. But there was a small group of people that would buy as much shoes as they could get their hands on. And I think after this shoe came out, that group of people ballooned. You know, now it seems like every other weekend there's 10 different things dropping that are store exclusives or store collaborations that are either built to get people in the store or built to draw attention to a particular silhouette. It was definitely a lot harder to find and it was definitely a little more authentic. This was part of the, um, the Art of the Dunk series. So it was, um, it was uh, I think the 25th anniversary of the dunk and it was actually a, a city-based dunk. So Nike came to me and said, we want you to design a, a dunk that's dedicated to New York City. When I designed this pigeon dunk, I knew it was a great shoe, but I didn't know it was gonna affect the world that it did. Honestly, nobody knew what was gonna happen, so we just, we did it like any other release. We picked the release day, announced the release day, and then was preparing ourselves to sell it, not knowing what was gonna happen. Yeah, it was a really whack three days. Um, it was fucking, it was winter, so it was cold. There was, I think, a, a night of snow. It was really terrible, um, but like, it got crazy quick. People have, were already putting them up on eBay, like the ones that were sold before. So people knew the kind of resale value for shoes. Like this was kind of when those guys were coming out of the woodwork, like, oh, I can make some money off this. I'm gonna get the shoe. There were campouts before, so people camped out for Jordans. So I understood the concept of a campout, but it was weird that they were camping out for something that hadn't been seen. Sight unseen, they were camping out. Cause I never released a picture of this and there was none leaked to my knowledge. So it was just the fact that Staple was working on a dunk and there's pigeon shit. That's the only clue that they got. This is, this is where the kids started lining up like four days prior. Mm -hmm. So they were like, they were tying their lawn chairs and tents yep, to this yep. gate here, yeah. you know. Um, and then like at night, sometimes they would, they'd have their car parked over here and just jump in at night because it was freezing. Yeah. I remember it was, it was right. like this. It was hectic. There was fights every night, but after a while you started bonding with the people next to you to try to hold your ground and make sure no one comes within your area, you sort of like formed alliances or some shit like that, you know? Every day leading up four days in, a couple of more kids were lining up. And I would say probably by the night before, there was probably like 30 to 40 kids sleeping out there, right? And I, I bought them all pizzas. Like I left work late that day. And then I went home. Next morning I came back at like 10 o'clock. It was pandemonium when I got there. The, the block was locked down and I was just like, what the fuck? fuck is going on here, you know? It was, it was really scary. There was obvious, like, thugs coming to the scene. At the end of the day, we're targets. Everyone online has a rap, at least 300 bucks on them. You could just see heavy snorkel jackets. You could see baseball bats peeked out from under the snorkels. You could see knives. I saw a machete. Like, people were just tucking weapons in and waiting on all four corners for these you know, 13 to 18 year old kids. Everyone online had at least 300 bucks collectively. We probably had, you know, 100 people online. That's a lot of money, you know? Uh, I remember standing across the street right there. There were cops. <laughs> I was just sort of like trying to take notes, trying to talk to people, trying to get my head around what had happened. Uh, and I looked down and there was a giant knife on the, just on the street. You know, I was on the police department a little over 20 years and that was pretty much the only time I can remember that the release of sneakers, uh, an item like that created such uh, almost riot. They weren't ready for this. So it was a good thing that we were there to help them out. The entire time the gate was down. And so I think what I did was after I assessed what was going on, talked to some of the cops, went through the back door, right? Came in through the back and then 
just tried to assess what was going on. And I remember taking a shot from in here of the gate down with cops still trying to pull people out of the line, but kids hanging onto the mm -hmm. gate. I guess looking at it from an insider's point of view, it was crazy, you know, but at that point, you're not thinking about anything else. Fortunately, there were, you know, there were a bunch of cops there also. They saw the line, they saw, not even the line, they saw the mass of people there and they, they were like, all right, we're gonna help you figure this out and, and do this. So Reed Space luckily has two entrances. So they let people in through one entrance. We closed the back entrance on Allen Street and they actually called the TLC, the Taxi and Limousine Commission, to have taxis lined up on Allen Street so that once kids bought the shoe, they just hop right into a cab and go. This one officer, who was actually very nice, he like knew it was kind of crazy. He actually, once we shot through, bought it, went through the back exit on Allen Street, he hailed a cab for us and paid for the cab for us to go home. We're out of shoes by one. We open at noon, I think. We're out of shoes in an hour, right? So now we've just had like the biggest sale day of our lives, you know. Um, cops have cleared out. We want to reopen the store and like commence our, our normal course of business. Um, and then uh, the news people came. There's a footwear frenzy going on in the city right now. A special sneaker made just for New York is in such high demand, people are fighting to own a pair of these things. I just saw these kids sitting out in the cold. And so eventually I said, what's going on? The next morning, I get a call from a friend of mine. This is literally like 8 in the morning, 7 in the morning. And, and she was like, what the hell did you guys do yesterday? Next morning, New York Post, morning edition, front page, top of the newspaper, sneaker frenzy riot with this shoe on the cover. You know, as far as kind of the, the sneaker world goes, suddenly, you know, the news was talking about kids reselling sneakers. I mean, it was it was an overnight change, you know, like shoppers at Reed Space were all like OG sneaker heads, streetwear heads, you know, you could see them, like you, you could just see what they wear and you know. Literally that weekend, people in suits came in, like people who were probably hedge fund managers and day traders, and maybe last week they were really into cigars and wine, were now like, heard about sneakers, I should be buying sneakers as an investment. So to see that happen, you know, was kind of an awakening to this entire community that already existed, you know, but all of a sudden, sort of the blinders were off. People always want to go back to this, and it, it's A, a testament to how historic this thing is, but it's also a testament to like how, if you're an artist and you create one slamming home run thing, like how long that can, transpire and last for. And it's, there is always that double-edged sword, but it's, it's a respect that I have for how great this thing is. But it's also like, damn, I wish I could like, you know, be known for other things too. But then I'm like, no, I'm not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth. Like, it's pretty amazing to be known for this one thing. And I think a 10 year mark, like if you, if people still talk about it 10 years later, it's probably gonna be forever maybe. I don't know, like it's, it, there's no stopping it after 10 years, you know?